Hello everyone. Can you hear me? <laughs> and Ario is saying hola, hola Ario. Good, thank you. Po is saying hulo. Oh, that is nice. I, it would be nice to learn how do you say hello in different languages. I can, I think I can say hello in a couple of languages, but yeah. Um, okay, so give me just one second. I need to um, close a couple of couple of windows here on my computer. Congratulations, Nam. Can can you tell us a little bit more details about that? Uh, SCA is the conference on computer animation. I see, and uh, my team. Uh, supervised by Michael Van de Pen, won the best paper award. Nice, uh, amazing. Congratulations, congratulations. That's very nice. Um, sorry, I'm I'm just. Okay, so. I'm recording. Yes, I'm recording already. Good. So everything is fine. We have 69 people, which is good. Nothing happened yet, William. Nothing happened. Don't worry. Okay. So, um, a couple of announcements. Let me just start the presentation, by the way. Okay, so can you see my, my screen? It says review one. <laughs> no, no clicker question, 80% grade, no worries. Okay, perfect. Okay, so a couple of annou announcements. Um, first, the so we everybody knows that the, the midterm is on Wednesday, right? So today we'll have a review. I have a lot of slides. And uh, yeah, so as I told you, I, I will probably take more than one hour. So I will, I will not stop if obviously you have Others or other things to do after the hour, you can just leave. And if some people can stay, it will be nice. Uh, so the midterm will be from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. exactly. So uh, no, no new material today, Paul. So today is only only review. Yeah. Again, if you think you already know everything and that you don't need the review, that is perfectly fine. You don't need to be here, right? So that is also that is also fine. And obviously, this this uh, session is also recorded. I will also upload it to YouTube, to our webpage, and to Canvas. Okay. Uh, no quiz after as well. Yes, yeah, exactly. We don't have quiz today, so no worries. Okay. So the exam again, the, the midterm will be from uh, three. Sorry, from um, yeah. So th from three p.m. to four p.m. Right. Uh, it will it will be a forty five minute quiz. It will be on Canvas. Okay. It will be a open book, uh, open book midterm, so that is convenient for you, right? Um, yeah. So basically, that is that is the information that I can tell you today. So it is synchronous. So super super important. And please, if you are not seeing this on on, on live and you will see you see this video a bit after the lecture, please take notes. If you, if the, if 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 it's absolutely impossible for you to be exactly on Wednesday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. to do the exam, please send me an email, right? Because what we can do is for people that are there in, in, in a different country or something like that, we can maybe like set up a specific second time for those people. But I would prefer to have everyone at the same time, right? So only if it's like completely impossible for you to actually make the exam uh, synchronously. Um, okay. So, any more questions about that? I think it's clear, right? Oh, Ario is asking, do you know what? Okay, so yes, I am I, I am planning to upload a sample midterm. The thing is, important. I uploaded samples for the theories, the, the second theory assignment already on, on the, on, I, I posted something on Piazza. 
and I uploaded those examples on uh, our website. So did you solve those? Say yes if you already checked those examples. Okay, I'm worried that some people are saying no. Okay, so please, after this... <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> okay, so what I did, I posted I posted on Piazza. You, you should always see what happens in Piazza. Actually, I, 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 if I remember correctly, I forced Piazza to send you an email with that post in particular. So what I did is, uh, many people were asking about uh, like uh, examples for Theory 2 because Theory 2 is a bit more complicated and uh, yeah, some t topics as the coordinate systems and all those stuff, uh, some some are uh, a bit more, um, they're still confusing for, for some people, right? So people were asking if, if we had more resources and we do. At the end of our web page, we have links to all the previous uh, lectures from from past years, right? From all the previous courses. And if you go and check those web page, in those web page, you have a lot of material. You have a lot of theory assignments with their solutions, right? But apparently, I don't know. People <laughs> sometimes is it doesn't have time for go and look for that information. So what I did is I grabbed all those examples from uh, previous years. There are they were already there, right? But, I just grab them and I put them on the web page, right? So if you go to our, our to our website and you see the link we have for theory two, you will see another link that says examples. So you go and click there, and you will see the I think from uh, twenty fifteen to twenty nineteen, I think something like that. I I am giving you all the examples from theory two, the original document and the solutions. I'm pretty sure once you see how everything is solved because basically our theory assignments is is, is basically this there are basically the same questions obviously with different numbers right but conceptually is is basically the same so i'm pretty sure when you see how it's solved uh yeah most of your confusions will be gone so uh and someone is asking yes i will i will post the info from from the from the midterm don't worry because actually let, let me tell you what what uh, I am doing right now. So right now I, I am still we are still f uh, finishing to define the midterm, right? This is a creating a midterm is a not, is, is is like creating a work of art because I I need to measure exactly which topics I I think or I consider that you already you you already know uh, like like yeah you're capable of answering questions about those so so I, I need to identify those type of, of questions those type of uh, topics right but I'm also um, for example uh, if, if there is a topic that I I mean checking all your piazza questions and like sensing the students I, I, I can see that maybe the majority of people is really still very confusing and there I mean if that you is clear that you don't understand, I will probably not make questions about that, right? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to, to create a question that everybody will fail, right? If 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 someone if the entire group fails in a in a, a specific question in an exam, it means that it's is not the is not a fall from from the students. It's probably a fall from 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 the teacher, right? So yeah, so creating a midterm is is very complicated, and it also uh, measuring the time that takes to uh, to actually solve a midterm is also very tricky because if I am creating the midterm, I as as a, as a professor, I cannot measure the exact time you will take, right? So I need to work this with my TAs, right? So we are still in that process. Once we finish that process, we will create a um, yes, like a sample from the midterm because we will. I, I want you to see how the entire uh, operation is is done. So. We will have uh, basically the same format on Canvas. I will ask you to go to Canvas and solve that like uh, mock-up midterm, right? So it will have it will uh, like help you to to understand what type of questions you can have and whatever. And also, I I, I also need to see if is if uh, if there's someone that have uh, like a technical problem uh, with Canvas or things like that. There, there are a couple of details in with canvas are that, that I'm, um, I'm worried about so for example if some of you have 
pro uh, problems with uh, your internet connection, right? And you're doing a, an exam on Canvas, right? And let's pretend that the, the exam on Canvas is, it has uh, 40 minutes, right? So it's a 40 minute uh, exam and you're doing your exam. And suddenly you just, you just lose your connection. The time in which you are not able to connect to Canvas, right? Doesn't matter for Canvas. Canvas is still counting the, the time. So if you take like 20 more minutes into like reconnect to Canvas because you just lost, right, uh, your your connection, basically you just lost 20 minutes of your of your exam, right? So those details are important. I need to see what happens with the with the mockup midterm. So I think um, I will pro probably post that midterm on, on the weekend. Not that midterm, sorry, that like test midterm on the weekend but in general for studying for the midterm you need to study the lectures you need to study the review from today and and uh, and also the this um, solution examples from theory 2 uh, they are also very a uh, very good uh, uh, yeah like source for for studying but just su super so something super important in some of those theory two assignments that I uploaded already, those examples from previous years, you will see that some of those have questions from topics that we haven't covered, right? Because obviously every year we change the topics a little bit. So don't worry about those, right? So if, if you see some of those, some questions that they're like talking about something that we haven't covered, that obviously will not be on the midterm, right? So the midterm will be, will cover exclusively the topics that were covered and discussed on the lectures, only the ones in the lectures. Okay. Good. Um, and someone is asking, by the way, what do you need? What do we need to prepare for the intro assignment, face-to-face -face grading? Good question. I will. I will say, I, I would like to take the t this time. I mean, the time for for this review to like focus on on, on the in general review. So maybe. Please uh, post that that uh, on, on on Piazza, and TAs will will give you details, right? Yeah, because uh, yeah, and and don't worry, I, I I think the face to face grading will be after the midterm. So we also wanted to not not put more pressure more more pressure to you uh, more than the midterm itself. Okay, good. So let's let's jump with this. Um, okay, give me a second. Okay, so what what I'm what I have right now, what I have as 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 a review, is basically what I did is basically I collected from all our presentations. I collected the the slides that I think are conceptually more important in terms of yeah regarding the types of questions that I can ask in a midterm, right? So that is what I have. Um, I'm also changing the the actual notes. So, for example, I've posted, I, I make a post on Piazza, like yeah, I think I think I posted like two hours ago or something like that. That I also ch I, I I I changed the PDF from, I think it was per fragment operations. So I added a, a couple of more notes to that PDF. So if you have the the old version, you can just throw it to the garbage and you can go and download the new one. So what I'm doing right now is also like depending on your questions on Piazza, Sim, how are you like dealing or having problems? I am checking my my own presentations. I am like adding more notes or modifying a couple of a couple of things. So yes, I mean no slides, no sets of lights is perfect and we are all always improving. And and again, if you can give me more feedback, that it will be very nice. Okay. So let's start talking. So Important concepts concepts in computer graphics. It's super important that you you understand the difference between raster images and vector images, right? So we said raster images are the ones that are composed of individual pixel pixels. These are the ones, uh, for example, that you create with your uh, phone's camera, right? So this is a, it's a discrete set of information. And something important about raster images is that if you just increase the size if you zoom in, right? You basically lost uh, information because the information is basically discrete, right? So you can see the pixels, right? And this is obviously 
<laughs> before in artificial intelligence, right? <laughs> Later, we will see that artificial intelligence, AI and deep learning is basically changing a lot of stuff in, 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 in computer graphics. But yeah, so if you're not using any sort of deep learning magic, right? Summing a raster image will basically lost information because the information is just discrete and you see the pixels, right? Something that doesn't happen with vector images, right? Vector images are, based, are composed of curves, right? So it's basically a mathematical equation that is saying, okay, this area right here is green, this area right here is red or whatever, and you can do whatever um, zoom you want and everything is perfectly fine. So the equivalent of vector images, but in 3D is what we usually call CAD models, right? Or uh, computer aided design models. So these models are um, usually um, uh, used in, in um, uh, like in manufacturing, for example, right? So these models are not created by, by discrete um, pieces of geometry, right? They're not created by triangles or, or quads, for example. They're created by also curves, right? So basically those are like surfaces that are basically connecting curves, right? So these are, again, the equivalent in 3D to what a vector image is. So if you have a model like this one, it, you can you can zoom in to a model no matter what how complex it is, and you will ne never see the triangles, right? Because the triangles are basically like computed in real time, defined by the curves that are defining by, by, by this, this surface, right? Okay, and we also have polygon meshes. Those are the equivalent in 3D of a raster image, right? So those are defined by faces, by triangles, right? So it means that if you zoom in, you will see the geometry, you will see the triangles, and it, it might be ugly, right? We also talk about um, other type of modeling techniques that are in this case representing 3D volumes. And we talk about voxels and the, interestingly, people were very interested in voxels, it's very nice. So this is a, a sample from Minecraft, right? So voxels basically is you take, you take a volume, right? You take a 3D model and you just fill the space with little cubes, right? And all the cubes are, have exactly the same, exactly the same size. And you basically like turn off or uh, turn on or off those voxels or those cubes, depending if they are inside the geometry or outside the geometry, right? In this case, for example, the bunny model, these cubes right here have different size, right? It means that what you're doing here is just representing the same bunny with different resolution of voxels but in the same model, voxels will have always the same size, right? So once in this voxel uh, stage or in this voxel uh, 3D model, right? The size of the voxel is defined in this case is one millimeter. All voxels have one millimeter of side, right? It's different to represent volume shapes with uh, tetrahedral meshes. Uh, the shape is different, right? So it's not a cube, but also they can be distorted, right? So usually what happens with this type of meshes and also with hexahedral meshes is that they can have different sizes and also they can be deformed because in the end, they basically try to, to fit into the outer surface of the object, right? So in this case, for example, hexahedral meshes, some of those are very similar to voxels, right? I mean, this one here, it seems almost like a perfect cube, but it's not a voxel, right? The voxel is always a perfect cube and all voxels should be exactly the same the same size, right? Exactly as you see on Minecraft. But hexahedral hexahedral meshes is different, right? They can be distorted, so as you can see, sometimes they're not exactly as cute, right? And they can have different sizes to basically adjust to the outer surface. And it's just another way to represent data in computer graphics, right? We also talk about um, procedural modeling. So basically, when you create a 3D model for a video game or whatever, you either have a 3D artist, right, that, that manually creates that object, or you can have equations and algorithms that, that create those models, right? So for example, this is from a paper from um, Peter Wonka and Muller and, Muller and Wonka. 
and basically they what they did is they came up with the uh, with a set of rules that describe the type of house that were built in like ancient Rome, right? So basically now you have an algorithm that you can say, okay, just so given this space, I want one million houses with exactly that like architectural type, right? And it's just creating geometry using those rules, right? So when, when we would talk about geometry that is not created by a human, but is created by equations, that term that we use is procedural modeling, right? And by the way, the word procedural is uh, it's a common uh, term in computer graphics. So for example, if someone uh, tells you about procedural animation, it's the same. That animation was not done by a 3D artist, but by either a learning system or just some equations, right? So procedural animation will be an animation that is not done by humans, but by certain algorithms, right? Okay. And then we talk about the types of render, right? So we have either online rendering, which is basically the real-time rendering. The entire pipeline that we discussed is based on that, right? Real-time rendering that usually happens on our GPU, right? So that is one type of rendering. And the other type of rendering is the offline rendering, which usually it's done with something called ray tracing, which also will be covered on, on our lecture, and you will actually uh, you will write a, a ray tracer, right? And um, yeah, and also, sometimes it's also called pre-rendering, right? So this is not in real time. This is done uh, with different types of algorithms. It usually can achieve more realism, right? Right? I mean, there are impressive techniques in offline rendering, in, in real time rendering sorry, in online rendering, in real-time rendering, to, to, to create like super, super realistic scenes, right? Like modern video games are, have impressive things. And we will, I will explain you that also later in, in other lectures. But in general, like if you really want to like mimic what light actually does with materials and how it reflects and things like that, if you want to like create a, a, an absolutely impressive realistic image, Basically, you need to do offline rendering, right? And usually it's ray tracing. Right? Okay, and we have a question. How do you prevent the game size from blowing up with offline rendering, though? Um, I don't understand your question. Do you mean if if the game is, I mean, if, if you have, like, a lot of geometry? Or what, what do you mean? Okay, yeah, but what, what what do you mean by really getting, really, sorry, getting really big? Oh, okay, okay, okay. No, good question, good question. So you're, okay, so someone is asking how to prevent the game from getting really big with many assets pre-rendered in terms of storage. Very good question. The thing is, games are not, they, they don't use the pre-render uh, paradigm. Like every, in every game you have, what they use is basically the other paradigm, right? They use the online option, right? So it's not pre-rendered. What sometimes is pre-rendered is the illumination, right? And that is something called uh, baking, right? So baking is, imagine that you want to represent this object in a, in a video game and you want this super, super realistic shadows. What you could do is you can use uh, pre-rendering techniques like ray tracing to create those shadows, for example. And then basically those shadows, you convert those shadows in a texture and you assign that texture to this object. And then you can show this object in a real time, um, in a real time application, right? That is not exactly computing the lighting, but it's just getting the information directly from a texture. But again, I mean, this, we haven't talked about that topic yet. So I, I would, I, I, I don't, I don't like to, come up with new new topics in a review, right? Because that will not be included in your midterm. But yeah, but in general, what happens is that, yeah, games usually don't use offline rendering. And also something important is that games use a lot of procedural modeling techniques, right? So if you're playing, for example, a video game, a 
huge video game with I mean this type of video games like 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 GTA for example in which you have uh, I don't know thousands of buildings and it, it's just amazing and you see and you 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 can think like oh my god like where are they uh, like storing all those buildings right I mean those are, those are like just millions of objects well in many cases those objects were not existing in your computer before you were rendering those right those are just Compute um, 3D models, they're created in real time using procedural modeling techniques. So most of those buildings, for example, there is no OBJ 3D model for those buildings. They're just like created immediately with procedural modeling techniques. Okay. Then we talk about vectors, right? And we were saying, okay, what is a vector? And we were we discussed that. That question, uh, the answer to that question depends of who is asking, right? If we are talking about um, programming or um, uh, mathematical perspective or a geometric perspective, right? So we talked that in terms of, for example, linear algebra, right? A vector can represent or the information that is construct that, that you use to construct a vector can represent a position or a vector, right? So in the end, we, we talked that... Um, you will use the same data, right? X, Y, Z values to represent either position or, or, or vectors, right? But those are different stuff. And this is super important. And and, 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 and that's why I always uh, try to insist that it's, it's important for you to, to understand the concepts, right? Um, so a position or a point is just describing a position in space, right? And that's it. And it usually have associated you usually have an associated vector. But a vector is different, right? Because a vector represents direction, represents can represent motion, for example. And it also, the magnitude of, of a vector can represent many, many things, right? It can represent force or it can represent the area of something, right? So in the end, vectors and points or vectors and positions are different creatures. However, we use exactly the same data to, to, to deal with them, right? And in terms of Geometric algebra, that is just another branch of math, right? The same data, right? It's used to represent, again, positions or vectors, which in the case of geometric algebra is the, the way you inter, in, uh, the way you understand a vector is just a directed length, right? And you also use exactly the same data to represent Y vectors, which in this case is a directed area. We also talk about tri vectors, but I'm not including those right now because we are actually not using tri vectors uh, much. So I don't want to just cause confusion. But but yeah, the same data is used for representing for represent these uh, types of objects, right? We also talk about the vector operations that this should be very uh, easy for you because in the end you, you have uh, previous knowledge on linear algebra, right? And in linear algebra, you you know all the, all this stuff. So basically, dot product what measures is the similarity of two vectors, right? Um, and this is super important, right? So if two vectors are basically uh, are exactly the same, right? Uh, the result will be one, right? So that's why we measure similarity, right? So it is one. It is a positive value if those vectors are exactly the same, right? If they are orthogonal, right? If they are 90 degrees one from each other, the result is basically zero, right? And but there are some details here. So for example, what do you think? If you want to measure the similarity of vectors, of two vectors, do you need those vectors to be unitary or not? What do you think? I'm seeing the chat right now. So Tommy is saying no. So no. What do you think? It doesn't matter if they're unitary or not. So I can I can have I can have any vector. So imagine that I want to measure the angle between two vectors, right? I mean, measuring the similarity of two vectors is 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 some somehow is like measuring the angle between those vectors, right? So what do you think? What happens if you want to measure the angle of, between two vectors using a dot product, right? From two vectors that are not necessarily normalized. Y 
Yes, exactly. So thank you, Tommy. Yes, they need to be unit vectors, right? You need to normalize them, right? So if two vectors are not normalized and you're using the dot product, right, to uh, compute, for example, the angle between them, or just by to compute their similarity between them, right? Uh, if they're not unitary, if they're not normalized, right? Basically, the result is useless, right? So that these type of things are the type of things that I might ask on a midterm, right? Okay. Good. Now let's talk about the cross product, right? So this is this is kind of is conceptually speaking, it's like the opposite the opposite of dot product because the dot product measures the similarity between two vectors, and the cross product measures the difference between two vectors, right? So this is a cross product. And something that is super, 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 super important about the cross product is that, and we already mentioned this, but this is a this is basically a new slide that I think I, I, I didn't include this slide before. But the cross product follows the right hand rule. I'm already told you this many times that I haven't shown you this this graph, right? So basically what this is saying that if this is your right hand, right, and you imagine that the, the two vectors that are your taking the, the cross product, right, are basically oriented like this, right? The order in which you take that cross product basically um, defines the way the resulting vector is or the orientation of this resulting vector, right? So if it's A cross B, in this case, right, A cross B, again, using or seeing the order with your hand, the resulting vector will always be pointing in direction of your thumb, right? So what happens if it's A, sorry, if it's B cross A, what will happen? I'm just, I'm seeing the chat, by the way. Yes, it will point down, exactly. Downward, perfect, yes. Good. So this is super important, okay? Cross product is always following the right hand rule. This is super, super important, okay? I hope this is this is clear. Okay, and, and we also discuss, um, okay, and sorry, but what happens, what happens, what do you think happens? Again, if the, if these vectors, if A and B are not unitary vectors, can I perform the same computation to get this vector? Or if they're not unitary, it turns out that they, result is useless. So it's the same as the dot product? Do I need to normalize them? What do you think? Okay, someone is saying no. Someone is saying yes. Again, someone is saying no. Someone is saying yes. Okay, so we have 50-50. Again, that's why these type of things are very important. The thing is, it's, it's more important for you to understand these type of questions than to actually like uh, remember, like take by memory, for example, the equation, right? Because it doesn't matter the equation, you just go and check it on Wikipedia, right? Or just read it in your book. The conceptual things are important. So it turns out that in the case of cross product, the cross product is, it can be useful even if it's uh, from two vectors that are not uh, normalized. And uh, so one of the, the most useful uh, uh, ways to use a uh, cross product, for example, is to compute uh, the area of a triangle, right? So imagine that this, that you have a triangle formed by these two vectors, right? If now this vector, for example, is huge, let's imagine that now A is like, I don't know, maybe here, right? It's huge, right? The triangle changed, right? So if you want to compute the area of a triangle using a cross product, you don't need to normalize the vectors. Actually, if you normalize the vectors, the area will be totally different to the one that you really want, right? So you actually need to compute the cross product with non-normalized vectors, right? To, to get this vector, the resultant vector. And uh, if you remember, right, if you take the cross product between two vectors, the magnitude of that uh, cross product vector, right, will be two times the area of the triangle, or basically the area of the parallelogram. And that is what, what is uh, basically the interpretation of the geometric algebra in terms of the cross product. So 
we also discussed about this, right? In 3D, and this is only in 3D, right? Uh, a cross product and a wedge product basically are the same, right? So, the, but again, this is only in 3D, right? So if we're talking about 3D vectors, taking the wedge product between two vectors is exactly the same as taking the cross product. It's just the way it is interpreted, right? So from the from the linear algebra perspective, the cross product gives you a vector that is orthogonal to the plane in which the original vectors are lying, right? But from the geometrical uh, algebra interpretation, what you obtain is a bivector, which is a basically a directed area, and is the directive is basically the area of this parallelogram, right? So again, the either the wedge product or the or the cross product, right? Basically, is the same math. It's useful to compute the area of, of a triangle, right? Because basically the area of this triangle is just half of this area, right? And sorry, someone is putting links of Discord. What is that? Okay, if that is related with the, <laughs> with the review, it's perfectly welcome. If not, and it can be just distracting people. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about other topics, you can talk that in, in yes. If it's not related, let's not have uh, any distractions. Uh, yes, and I think someone has a question. Nam has a question. Yes. Hey, um, so from what I understand, the cross product is, um, so the magnitude of the cross product is uh, equivalent to the parallelogram, the area of the parallelogram spanned by the two yes. vectors, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so the triangle's area would be half of Yes, okay. exactly. Good, yeah. good, okay, then we spent a lot of time talking about the rendering pipeline, right? And, and the first part was uh, to define what is basically the input of our rendering pipeline and basically the graphics primitives, right? So the very, very basic graphic primitives are either points, lines, or triangles, but we have other extended graphic primitives, so instead of uh, only lines, we also have line strip and lines loops, right? And again, this is just the same concept just with a different data structure to like save space. And but yeah, but in the end, it basically are the same, right? In terms of triangles, you also have like extended graphics primitives in terms of triangles. You can create triangle strips, triangle fans, or you can have quads, which we said that in the end, these quads are going to be triangulated inside a graphics pipeline because as you probably remember already uh, almost the entire process of the of the rendering pipeline is is based on triangles right so in the end I have to have triangles everywhere and um, but yeah but these are basically what we send to our uh, rendering pipeline along with obviously information about uh, materials and textures and um, uh, information about your your lights for example the position of your lights the intensity of your lights so we have also more information but in terms of geometry this is the type of geometry that we send there right okay so we will see basically like a quick overview of the rendering pipeline so this is the first part right the vertex data this is where we basically define all the scene data and we send everything to the pipeline and Again, we know that the pipeline has some super interesting and very, very efficient uh, sections that are basically discarding, but they can discard triangles that are useless, right? But don't, don't trust that, right? I mean, uh, what you usually need is uh, you need to send as many triangles, uh, sorry, as many triangles, as less triangles as possible, right? So every possible optimization that you can do as human as programmer right to not send useless stuff to your to your rendering pipeline should be done here right so this is your application stage this is where you have either this is where uh, you have like blender maya trees to the max or whatever this is where your uh, javascript code is right so we talk for example that uh, a good example is when you want to render voxels right you could create a million voxels, right? A million, a million tiny boxes representing voxels, and send the entire million boxes to your rendering pipeline. And of course, your rendering pipeline will eventually get rid of most of 
the useless data, right? But it, it's, it's, that will be horrible, right? I mean, so what you usually do is you, you need to also like implement your own optimization algorithms. And, and remember that this is basically running on, on CPU, right? And you just send only the, the necessary information to your uh, rendering pipeline, right? So that is super, super important. And, and this is basically the first step. Um, then we have the vertex shader. We spent a lot of time talking about the vertex shader. Basically, its primary purpose is to compute the final position of each vertex on the screen space, right? And basically have this, um, make this composition of different transformation matrices, the model, the view, and the projection matrix to basically flat everything in 2D, right? Um, and we explain uh, that it, it runs one time per uh, vertex. That is super important. And it has no connectivity information, right? It, it works exclusively at vertex level, right? And we talk about the type of uh, the type of outputs that a vertex shader can can have. The most important one is the GL position, right? That in the end is the final position of each vertex. And we also discuss that the the purpose of a vertex shader is not just taking the original position of the of the vertices and just transform them or project them into the screen space. Because it's a programmable stage, we as humans can play with that position, right? So we can, in the end, deform the mesh. And you already did that on your uh, coding assignment, right? So this is the part that is very cool, right? We also discuss the type of variables we have on the vertex shader. And again, I'm not getting into details, right? Because we already have that on other lectures. But but again, this is this is what I could ask on the midterm. Right? I, I could ask, for example, explain what a uniform variable is, right? And you need to be able to explain in terms of where that variable is defined, either on the vertex shader or the fragment shader, if it's a global variable for everything, or if it's a local variable for for uh, for the specific vertices, all that stuff, right? I mean, the, the details of this type of uh, variables. So it's important for you to understand. Okay, then after the vertex shader, we have an entire section in which we can create new geometry, right? So in this section here, we create new, new geometry either by subdividing the current geometry, which it's called tessellation. So tessellate is basically creating new geometry using the current one, subdividing, right? Or by creating new triangles or new geometry from scratch that is done in the geometry shader. So again, tessellation, as, as seen here, is you take your original quads or your or your original uh, triangles and you just subdivide them, right? And this is a huge area actually of research, right? I mean, we, we haven't uh, get into like details about this, but you can see the details of subdividing algorithms on the geometry modeling course from Alan Schaeffer, for example. There are a ton of uh, possible algorithms to subdivide a mesh, right? But the, the, the goal of this is basically to obtain a better looking uh, shape, right? So if the this little car here, for example, if I will render this car from a camera that is very, very close, if I will make a close-up of, of this car, the car will look kind of ugly, right? Because the geometry, it, it, is, it doesn't have like much um, uh, resolution, right? So basically by subdividing its geometry, I'm creating more resolution and it will be uh, just better looking, right? The geometry shader, Again, can create new geometry, but not not based on the current one by subdividing. Just it creates geometry from scratch. So you can create these spikes on this bunny, or you can do literally whatever you want, right? You can create, uh, I don't know, you can have just points in space and you can render, you can create, uh, <laughs> you could, for example, instantiate a actual 3D model so for example, you could you, if you have a, a million million points on 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 your scene, and you also have the information of this bunny, so you could basically instantiate the geometry of the bunny in each of those million points, and you could have like a rain of bunnies, for example, right? Because yeah, that that is the type of thing that you can do with your geometry shader. Just create geometry from scratch. Okay, then we have this. Uh, stage called primitive setup so something conceptually important is that no more user defined triangles are created after this stage what, what do i mean the tessellation and the geometry shader 
creates new geometry, but those, those sections are optionals, right? Are optional sections. And those are driven by uh, user-defined um, uh, requirements, right? I am defining that I want to subdivide, to, I, I want to have, I don't know, three, four times uh, the, the, the actual resolution, or I want to, uh, I don't know, to render spheres in terms of, in, in, instead of, um, instead of uh, points, for, for example, right? But those are user-defined geometry, right? This is geometry that is created by, by the, the user. After this section here, the triangles that are basically created in the primitive setup, uh, we will not create any triangles, any new triangles that are created by, by, by the user, right? And we said that this basically organizes the vertices into the associated primitive. So this, this section uses um, connection, connection uh, information, right? Connectivity information, and basically prepares everything for the cooling and clipping, right? And also, conceptually speaking, in these three sections here, either the tessellation section or the primitive setup section, these stages require connectivity information, right? So if you remember, we said that the vertex shader does not contain or does not, you don't have connectivity information on the vertex shader. You're only working at vertex level. However, these sections here, because they're dealing already with triangles or quads, they need connectivity and they have connectivity information, right? Then everything is just passing through this area here. That basically the the objective of this uh, area is to discard or cut primitives that are basically outside the camera view. So we have two things there. One is the clipping, right? And the clipping is we have the frustum. This basically, I mean, in, in this case, it's a perspective projection, right? So we have a frustum that is basically the the volume that is visible from the camera, and using the planes of that frustum, you just remove everything, right? Remove all geometry that is basically outside that, right? If it's not visible that by, by the camera, why do we care to compute fragments or colors or whatever? I mean, it's, it's just nonsense. We don't need it, right? And something that is important is that um, sometimes you just get rid of those triangles. So if the entire triangle is outside the frustum, you just delete that triangle. But if you have a triangle that is basically in the middle, right? Part of the triangle is inside the frustum, and part of the triangle is outside the frustum, what you do or what the computer does uh, automatically, what the what that stage does automatically, is um, basically cuts the triangle, right? So it basically cuts the triangle and, and creates new triangles. So those are those are new triangles that are being created on the rendering pipeline, but those are not user-defined triangles, right? Because those are just automatically created depending of the intersection of that triangle in particular with a, every specific plane of the first term if it's like half and half, right? Okay, and Ken is asking, adding noise, will there be triangles created by GP GPU after the primitive setup? Oh, and you say, okay, I see. Yes, exactly. So for example, this is, this is a case in which we are already after the primitive setup, but we are still need to create new triangles because you just cut a triangle, right? So if you cut a triangle, you might need to create new triangles to, to have like the, the section that is basically inside the first one, right? But those are not user-defined triangles, right? Okay, so then is the cooling step. Basically, it's just detecting the triangles that are basically facing away from the camera, right? So, and and what is important here is here is um, under the concept of closed meshes, right? Because if you imagine a mesh that is open, right, that it has a hole, you might need to render the 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 interior of that mesh, right? If it's like a imagine like a like a plastic bag, right? A plastic bag, it's kind of like a three D model that is open, right? Because it has like a hole. So you don't need to only represent the outer outer surface from the plastic bag, but also the interior of the plastic bag. So in that case, for example, you can just turn off the back face cooling, right? But if you have a closed mesh like this bunny, right? If you have triangles that are basically facing to the other side of the camera, right? 
uh, you can just get rid of those triangles because you don't need them. They're not they're invisible for 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 the camera perspective, right? So that process is is uh, is its name is cooling, right? Get rid of the triangles that are basically facing away from the camera, and then we get into the rasterization section. Wow, I'm, this is this is a lot of talking today. Okay, so then we get to the rasterization. And basically, this stage will compute the fragments of each triangle, right? And also, it's interpolated values. So, as we can see here, right? If you have a triangle that is already like projected into to the space, <laughs> and someone is saying, <laughs> "I need, I need water." Oh, I, I don't drink alcohol, but yeah, I can drink water, probably. Okay, so once you have this triangle, right, projected into to the space, right? A, a, computing the fragments is computing the areas or the, the spots of that triangle, the, the portions of that triangle that basically are exactly in the same, the same position of a specific uh, uh, pixel, right? And remember, every time in my slides, every time I show uh, like, like circles, I am referring to fragments and not pixels, right? So the rasterization section computes those fragments, computes those portions of triangle that basically are in, in, in the same position of a pixel, but also computes the interpolation of the variables, right? So remember uh, something that, that happens between the vertex shader and the fragment shader is that some of the information that is computed on the vertex shader is interpolated into the fragment shader, right? Because the fragment shader is, is uh, working with fragments, which are a portion of the triangle, so the information that is contained in the triangle, in this case, for example, the normal, right? As example here. If now I am, I will send the information for uh, the fragment. So for example, maybe, maybe this will be a fragment. This portion of this triangle will, will have this fragment here, right? If I use exactly the same normal as the entire triangle, this will be my render, right? So in order to have a better, better looking surface, this is a, one of the tricks we, we do, right? We interpolate the values of the normals to kind of fake this uh, like smoother surface. And it's, this is important, and actually someone asked this on Piazza, and that's why I'm, I'm telling you that depending on your questions on Piazza, I'm uh, going and changing <laughs> the slides and everything. So we can compare the tessellation versus the interpolation, right? So. They, they both, these both ideas, conceptually speaking, they, they are aiming for the same result or they, are, they have the same, uh, the same goal in some, in some sense, right? They, they both aim for a better looking geometry, right? But the thing is, this, the result is not exactly the same, right? So this surface right here, it looks way smoother than this one, right? It looks very nice. This surface right here will look also better looking or smoother than this surface right here, right? So this is tessellation. This is interpolating normals. So the goal is the same, but the result is not exactly the same because what happens is that the interpolation is like faking a smoother surface, right? Because what we are doing is just smoothing the normals, but the geometry stays, stays the same, right? So if you see, for example, a 3D model that is rendered in, in whatever, WebGL or whatever system, right? But if you see a 3D model that looks very nice but the silhouette of the model, you can see like the geometry, you can see like 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 a jaggy border. It means that, that that is not a real smooth surface. It's just a trick, right, to fake a smooth, a smooth uh, um, geometry. And it's just a trick. And basically, geometry the geometry st stays the same, but the way we are shading the, the object is different because we are using interpolated geometry. If you see the border of the object, and the border is... It's also smooth. It means that that object, uh, it, it has way more geometry, right? So if it's not jaggy, it means that you used um, or, or someone used uh, subdivision or tessellation algorithms to actually create more geometry. Obviously, if you create more geometry, it's, it's more expensive, right? So this will get a more realistic, right? Tessellation will get a more realistic um, result, but it's obviously more expensive because you are creating more geometry. So if you go and check your favorite video game, whatever it is, and you see the 
pair the characters or whatever, pay close attention to the silhouette of the 3D models and you will, for some of those, you will probably see that the border is kind of jaggy, although the actual model looks just amazing, right? So yeah, same goal, not exactly the same result. Okay, so then after those, after the rasterization, we get into the fragment shader and we are, what time is it? Yeah, so we're almost in one hour, which is good. So I think I'm probably a bit of, uh, like, yeah, a bit a bit ahead of the half of the entire review. So yeah, pr we will probably have, we'll probably take maybe one hour and 40 minutes or something like that. I don't know. Okay, so fragment shader, we also discuss it. It, it, it purposes is, uh, computes the final color for the fragments, right? Not the pixels, this is important. The fragment shader computes the final color for fragments, not pixels, right? And it gets variables, right? It can get uniform or varying variables from the vertex shader, right? And we already explained what is a fragment, right? So we have two triangles here, right? The portion of each fragment, sorry, the portion of each uh, triangle that basically is on the same position, on the same projected posi position than uh, a specific vertex, right? that is called a fragment, right? So for a single vertex, you can have one, two, or thousands of fragments, right? So fragments are, could, you can have a lot of fragments for each pixel, right? And let me see if someone has questions. Uh, I don't, okay, someone is asking, are we able to intercept the pipeline like that? What do you mean by, yeah, I don't understand your question. Can you can you elaborate more? Okay, can Pixel have zero fragments? Yes, very good question, Can very, very good question. What happens, yes, if a Pixel has no fragments, it means that there are no visible objects basically projected into that Pixel. In that case, what, what, the, uh, what the OpenGL or DirectX or whatever will do is basically define the color of that pixel as the color of the background. So if you remember in your JavaScript, right, in your in your coding assignment, there's a part of the code in the JavaScript in which we are defining the color of the background, right? So the background could, could have a, uh, like a solid color, maybe white or green or whatever, right? So if a pixel has absolutely nothing in front, it has no fragments associated with the pixel, the color of that pixel will be the one from the background. And sometimes we define the background as, again, as a, as a solid color, but also you can you can define the background as uh, an image, for example, right? So you can have, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a landscape of Vancouver or New York or whatever as a background. And if that pixel in particular is not basically touching any object or there's nothing um, there, uh, yeah, it will be basically um, get the the color from the texture that is basically uh, yeah on the background. Okay, and someone is like, okay. I'm asking if we wanted polygonic type models as an art style. If we want polygonal type models as an art style. Oh yes, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I now I understand your question. Yes, exactly. So, um, for example, the the characters from if you see the characters from uh, well from Minecraft, right? The characters from Minecraft, you do exactly the opposite. You tell the shader to not interpolate the the the, the normals, right? Because you want the characters from from Minecraft, you want the cubes to look like cubes. You don't want to see. The smooth surfaces, right? So yes, very very good questions. Uh, yes, exactly that. Yeah, in the in those cases, yes, for sure. You you just basically you need to like turn off the interpolation of normal because you want the the original. Um, yeah. Good. Um, okay. I love your questions, guys. Yes, I, 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 yeah. You always do very, very, uh, very good questions. Okay, so fragment shader again. We eventually explain the type of inputs that you can get into the fragment shader, the type of output. The obviously the output from the fragment shader is this uh, GL frag color, right? So remember, is the fragment color, not the pixel color, right? So the 
the section of the pipeline that basically defines finally the color of the pixel is this uh, section called per fragment operation, right? And if you remember, we had to discuss this with, we had uh, an entire lecture for per fragment operations because it turns out that it is a pipeline itself, right? It is very, very complicated. And um, so these are these sections, right? So it's basically a pipeline with six sections. And don't worry, for example, in this, this type of things, because the pipeline is so complicated and so long, I, I could maybe ask like, oh, could you describe at least one of those per fragment operation? And maybe you can like choose one of those, whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, I don't expect that anyone can just, yeah, have the memory of explaining everything. Although remember that our midterm is an open book midterm, right? So you, you can check the, the slides and everything. Okay, so quick review, right? So we have the pixel ownership test. Basically, if you have a um, if you have your rendering area, right, and you have another window in your operating system, whatever it is, that is basically uh, occluding your rendering area, um, Windows is telling 60 times per second is just telling uh, WebGL or, or uh, OpenGL is telling which pixels um, are owned by OpenGL and which pixels are in this case owned by Chrome or whatever application you have that is basically occluding your, your window, right? So um, yeah, so this is basically the pixel own ownership test. We have the CSORT test that is basically the exact same concept, that, but now this is defined by the user. You as user defines a certain rectangular area that is only valid to render and another area that is probably not valid to render. Um, we have the alpha test. We also discuss about this, and this can can uh, use by achieve, to achieve certain effects, right? So, for example, to show that uh, a geometry that is actually very simple have more details, and this is this is useful for rendering grass or a hair or things like that. What you're doing here is basically you are obtaining the information, the color information from your fragment, and if the alpha value in this case, for example, is is zero. It means that that fragment is totally transparent, so you basically just don't don't take that fragment into account. And you can also use the alpha value to either, uh, if it's not exactly zero, right, you can use that alpha value to uh, represent, for example, a transparent, semi-transparent objects, right, and maybe blending colors, right? The stencil test, uh, uh, it uses something called stencil buffer. So again, this is similar to what the CSOR test or the pixel ownership test do in terms of like forbidding a certain number of pixels to be rendered, right? But because this is user defined, this is very powerful. What you usually do is for every pixel on your uh, on your two uh, D space, right? You assign a boolean value either zero or one that is basically telling your uh, rendering pipeline that you can uh, paint pixels or not basically so um, this is very nice because you can you can actually um, uh, something that is very common in, in webgl and video games actually is you don't you don't render your entire scene in one pass you can actually do several passes you can tell Op OpenGL to not create the final image in in a single uh, pipeline pass but you see several pipeline passes, right? Because the, the pipeline is so fast that you can actually perform two or three or four, five times the entire pipeline, right? Before actually create this, the, 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 the actual entire image uh, image composition and you can create amazing, um, amazing stuff. So for example, this video game right here, this portal, this is exactly what it does. Uh, the, the portal video game, what it does is you're rendering Two cameras. Well, in, in in this case, actually three cameras because you have another portal here, right? But you have one camera that is basically capture the entire scene. You have another camera that is basically representing the view from this hole, and another camera that is basically representing the view from this hole. So, and and every camera is a different pass. So, in this case, for example, this final image is rendered in three different passes with three different cameras, and for every camera, you are defining the area for camera one, for example, the area of pixels that are able to, to be painted by that camera. 
And in this case, for example, this will be black or zero in your stencil uh, buffer for the camera number one. So the first camera will not be able to render anything here because that will be basically rendered by the second camera. And because everything is parallel, it's super, super fast and you can achieve this type of uh, yeah effects. And this is also how the reflections are uh, uh, achieved in, 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 um, in video games. That is super interesting. So imagine that I want the floor to be reflective, right? You, 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 you will see later that if you want to create like real reflections, you actually do something called real, uh, ray tracing, right? We will talk about that later. So, uh, but you, you don't do ray tracing. You can, but it's super expensive. You usually don't do ray tracing in video games. So if you want to, for example, to have a um, reflective floor, what you do is you have a camera that is rendering the entire scene and another camera that is also rendering the, the entire scene, but that camera is basically placed in a different position that is ex the exact position you need to mimic the reflection from these objects, for example. And you just, re you just in that case, for example, that second camera will not render the floor, will just render these objects here, for example. And you are basically combining, in that case, you combine the camera one and camera two, right? And you can see, for example, reflections. Yeah, yeah. Again, we will talk about that later. But yeah, those are very interesting stuff, and you can basically achieve those with stencil test. Then the depth test. We also talk about this. It's just the the distance from each fragment to the camera, and you use this to just decide which fragment will be uh, rendered and which are basically hidden by other fragments, right? So in, if if we imagine that all the objects on the scene have an opacity of one, it means that they are totally opaque, right? The fragment that will survive is the one that is basically closest to the camera. So depth, the depth map or the depth buffer will kind of look like this. Everything that is basically closer to the camera has a higher value and those are the fragments that will basically survive. And the blending that is the very final stage of the rendering pipeline is when we, depending of opacity and all other things, we just combine colors, right, between fragments. So maybe for a, a specific pixel in particular, like this one here, because this triangle is actually a bit transparent, the color of this pixel needs to be not exactly the one that, from the fragment that is actually closer, but like a combination from, from those, right? So you get a an image that is kind of mimicking that this uh, object is kind of transparent. Okay, good. So that was the rendering pipeline. It's an hour already and we have still 22 people here, which I, 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 I um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so questions, <laughs> questions about this? No, thank you, good. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm, I mean, I cannot like, repeat everything right because we we have discussed many 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 things but it's just what i think is the most important are the most important concepts for for something like Dimitri. okay so then thank you nicholas uh okay so then we talk about coordinate systems and uh and we discuss many many things so for example we discussed if that uh if we have a coordinate system like this one for example right i cannot express point P on a coordinate frame like this, right? Because this this entire space of this coordinate frame is basically collapsed in a single line and basically point P is outside that space, right? So again, conceptual things that are basically important, right? And, but this is the definition, right? The coordinates of a point P, right? With respect to a coordinate frames are scalars from the basis vector. So basically the coordinates of this point P in this case is for one, it's just a scalar, right? It, it means that I need to multiply the basis vector i four times, like stretch it four times, and I just need to stretch it one time for basis vector i. And the position is then the sum of those scaled basis vectors plus the coordinate frame's origin. This is super important, and that is why I changed the color, because I think people is still having problems to, to understand when they need to take the position into account and when you don't need it, right? This is super important, right? The position in the end 
the position of the coordinate frame it is important okay so i think that the the confusion is because the thing is with coordinate systems sometimes we ask different questions right so we can we can do many things with the same concept right in the end a coordinate frame is just a matrix that is just uh, a collection of basis vectors right so with the same data or conceptually the same data we can do many different stuff we can translate from one coordinate to another or we can uh, if we already have the coordinates in one coordinate system we can ask like a, to translate like translating languages right to get uh, coordinates from a different coordinate frame or we can transform things right we can move rotate or whatever two points right so uh, if we, when we have a question like this one right so we want I want the coordinates of the point Q with respect to coordinate B, right? This is where we want the inverse of the matrix. Remember, this is where it's uh, it's like like translating from one language to another, right? So in this case, we know that we need to construct the matrix of coordinate frame B, taking the the coordinates of its basis vectors with respect to something. We usually, right? We usually take it with respect to a canonical coordinate frame in which case is frame a right or the grid so for example with a question like this you could not even have this coordinate frame a but if you have a frame sorry if you have a grid right you use the grid to compute these basis vectors right so computing the computing uh, the these positions using a grid it means that there is like behind or represented by that grid there is like a canonical coordinate frame so we always sort of we always have like a canonical coordinate frame that is not distorted right so a is not distorted a is what we usually expect for a coordinate frame it is aligned with the grid and is basically either represented by the grid right or is the the actual grid right so we have some we have some coordinate frame that is not distorted so we use the one that is not distorted to basically compute the column vectors and composed by those column vectors we have a matrix that because we are asking to compute the uh, the coordinates of b the coordinates of, of q sorry with respect to b we need to get the inverse of this matrix right and so the thing is give me a second something that 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 causes a lot of confusion here is and, and, and again, I'm, I'm talking about like my previous experience as teacher because I've teach computer graphics many times, is that people sometimes get confused when we said that you need to construct the matrix from these basis vectors with, res with coordinates with respect to A. And also that you need to compute the point of Q, this vector here, also with coordinates with respect to A. Because sometimes people is, gets confused and they think, oh, but this is wrong because the position of Q with respect to A is 4, 4, right? Not 2, 0. So that is why I explain you that in this case in particular, only in this case in particular, it's like you take the coordinate frame A and you put it exactly in the same position of B, right? In this case in particular, because you are using the grid, right? It's like the two coordinate frames have the same origin, right? So now it's clear that the point Q has coordinates to zero with respect to A, and this basis vector has coordinates one and minus two, and this basis vector has one, one, right? In this case, it's clear. Good. And we also said that uh, one way to solve this, right, is by using the inverse of this matrix. This is one way to solve it. And the other way is because this other explanation we had about a cord about a coordinate system right that is basically just scalars multiplying basis vectors you can also see the same problem as this as a scalar that is multiplying this basis vector plus another scalar that is multiplying this basis vector that will be equal to this position of q right so that is just a system of equations that usually i mean not usually but sometimes can be simpler than taking the inverse right and after you compute that you basically get that alpha is two thirds beta is four thirds and those are basically your coordinates from this point here with respect to the coordinate frame b right 
And that is exactly the same as computed with the inverse of the matrix, right? So depending of the numbers you have there, sometimes taking the inverse is actually easier. So you can just get the inverse or sometimes it's just easier to just get the um, the this uh, combination of, of, of equations. But uh, again, and I will insist on this, uh, I will never ask you to compute the inverse of a matrix of a big matrix on a midterm. Even even if it's if, if the midterm is, is an open book midterm and you can use your your calculator and and uh, yeah stuff like that, I will never ask that. So if for example in a midterm or in a final exam, uh, there is something like that in which apparently you need to get the inverse of a matrix there's probably a bit more information in the question and is maybe because taking the inverse of that matrix is actually easier, right? So for example, we already discussed that um, if the matrix, for example, is a rotation matrix, it means that rotation matrices are always orthogonal, right? And the inverse of a orthogonal matrix is just the transpose. So obviously taking the transpose, the transpose is obviously super easy, right? Or again, maybe uh, you need to you need to see the numbers of that matrix and maybe it's easier instead of computing the inverse it's maybe easier to compute the result uh, um, using this approach right this approach of just creating the equations uh, and looking for alpha and beta right but yeah but again if you think oh my god no Enrique wants me to get the inverse of this four by four matrix and this will take me like ten minutes then yeah probably. You need to observe the data, and it's, that is probably not, not true. Okay, good. So, what, and, okay, and just quick. So, this is, this is the example, again, when we want to get coordinates of a point with respect to B. But in your theory, in your second theory assignment, we have a question in which we are asking to give the matrix that converts, for example, the matrix that converts any point in coordinate frame B to N, to to coordinates A, right? So basically, like a, the matrix that is that that could translate any point from B to A, where I can ask, okay, give me the the, the the matrix that it basically translate from A to B. In that case, you you do need to include the position, right, of A and B, because remember, in the end, a position is just a coordinate. The coordinates of a position is just uh, some scalar multiplying its basis vector, but it's also adding the translation of that, right? So if you still have questions of, uh, uh, from regarding that, please go and check it out, the examples, the example solutions that I gave you from theory two. So please check those. I'm completely sure that once you see how that section of the theory, th theory two is solved in, in, in those uh, previous year's documents, I'm pretty sure you will not be um, uh, confused anymore because it's basically the same question. You will see basically the procedure in that in and and because that that case like getting this uh, uh, translation right that matrix for translating from one coordinate system to another uh, again you need to include position. That is exactly what we did with the camera. We already did it with the camera. Remember we computed the the matrix from the camera and we computed the orientation of the camera, but also we computed the translation from the camera, right? So the entire camera matrix has two things, has a rotation section, right? Basically, it is indicating the position of each basis vector from this orthogonal coordinate system from the camera, but it's also, it's, it, it also has a translation section, right? So you use those, those things, right? Because uh, again, I, I think people were still confusing and they thought that for those questions from theory two assignment, they they don't need to include the position, the difference in position from from the coordinate points. So please go and check those examples, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you will uh, you will be fine. Okay. And by the way, sorry, is I think today is the due date for the theory assignment, right? Say yes if it's correct. I think you need to finish today. Yes. Okay. Okay, so that so that is nice. So, if you if, if you somehow are still struggling, ah, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. So if you somehow are still struggling with the assignment, 
and you haven't seen those examples, I'm pretty sure you will open those PDFs and you will see, oh my God, this is so beautiful because you'll be able to solve basically everything. Those are just examples. Yes, okay, good. So it, it was a good timing for, for, for me to give you that information. Although it was, it was available, okay? Maybe you were not finding that information, but it was available. Okay, so we will also discuss affine transformations. I think this is probably already very clear, right? This is just a different way of encoding this information. Affine transformations are not three by three anymore. These are four by four. And basically they contain a linear transformation here that could be rotation, shear, um, reflection, all that, all that stuff, right? And uh, and also contain a an, an extra row and an extra column in which we include translation, right? And if we are dealing with points, we usually for the last part of the column vector we add a new value called W, right? Which is our homogeneous value because these are already homogeneous coordinates. Remember, when we add an extra dimension, these are already homogeneous coordinates, right? And uh, oh. Ario, what is the L matrix? This this part is the linear uh, the linear uh, transformation. So remember, in your affine transformation matrix, for example, this could be a three by three rotation matrix or a three by three um, a, a reflection matrix, for example, or three by three scale matrix. Right? Does that include the rotation? Yes, of course. I mean, again, this could be a rotation, for example. And yeah, rotation is linear, right? Yeah, remember, linear transformations are the ones that are basically leave the, the origin fixed, right? And, uh, and again, the beauty of these affine transformations is that if we are using points, you just add a, a number one. And if you are using vectors, you just add a number zero. Because in case of vectors, you never want to, you don't want to, to uh, translate vectors. And if you still don't understand that, you you might probably need to go and check that video. But remember, the thing is, if we are talking about, for example, the, 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 the normals of a surface, right? The normals should represent the direction that is basically perpendicular to the surface. So if I apply a transformation that contains translation to my entire object, and I apply to everything, to the points, but also to the normals, if I am applying a translation to a normal, what I'm modifying is a normal is a vector, and all vectors start from 0, 0, 0, right? Because we are using exactly the same data for expressing points and, and, and vectors. So what happens is, if I translate everything, I am translating the tip of the vector. So if you take a vector, whatever it is, and just take the tip and just move the tip, in the end, what you're doing is you're distorting that vector, right? You're rotating and scaling that vector because you're just moving only the tip, right? The origin it always stays at the center. So that's why... We never want to translate vectors, and by having a zero, it will be very, it will be nice because basically, is uh, the translation is discarded, right? Then we we said that those uh, weird vectors that we have right now that have this extra extra dimension, those are called homogeneous coordinates, and these are important because uh, basically homogeneous coordinates are uh, are uh, points that are in a different space. So uh, usually a homogeneous uh, vector is a vector that is in, in a space m plus one, right? So for example, in this case, if I am talking about points that are in a 2D Euclidean coordinates, I can add another dimension and I just jump to a 3D homogeneous coordinates, right? Or if I have points in a 3D homogeneous coordinates with x, y, z, the set of the 3D homogeneous coordinates if I want to translate those into 2D Euclidean coordinates, this is by taking the x and y and divide it by the set value, right? And uh, yeah, and this is, I think, important in terms of, again, conceptually speaking, regarding 2D homogeneous coordinates. Okay, and again, an another thing that is very nice about affine transformations is that now because they are four by four, and they're square and everything, we can compose those matrices. And it's very nice because we have, we could have a very complicated um, transformation, right? Maybe like moving, rotating and scaling and everything. And we can have separate uh, separate matrix for every transformation. We just multiply all matrices in, in a very specific order 
and we get a final metrics that you can use for your entire um, treaty model. That that obviously is very nice. Uh, so this is uh, this is one example, right? So we talk about this. If we want to, uh, for example, rotate this bunny with respect to point P, we need to first take the entire bunny, right? This is a translation matrix. So take the entire bunny and just translate it to the origin, right? Then you can rotate the bunny because remember rotation is linear, so the rotation will uh, will get the origin fixed, right? So now the origin of, of, of the bunny will be point P. It will be basically on the origin. So then you perform your rotation and then you just take the bunny back, right? And you combine everything and that is perfectly fine. And remember, because we are using column vector notation, the order of, of, of operations is from right to left, right? And we talk about transformation hierarchies. And I think this is also an example that some of you still have some confusion. So there's still people wondering why you need uh, translation. I think, I mean, the math here is correct, but I think maybe the way I the way I created this image is probably causing confusions. I I will probably, if I have time, I will probably modify the entire section of this PDF and I will probably modify this. But basically what happens is people is wondering, I think people in general understand already that, uh, for example, in case of the bunny, that the bunny doesn't need to rotate 90 degrees, right? Because from this bunny to this bunny is basically 90 degrees, right? I think most people understand already that it doesn't need to rotate 90 degrees because if its parent is the pedestal or the column, right, it only needs to rotate 60 degrees, right, uh, uh, contraclockwise. So a positive rotation of 60 degrees. I think most people understand that. But I think it's still kind of confusing for some people. Why do you need um, uh, to, to translate the, the bunny? The thing is, maybe I, I think... The, the reason this is, is confusing is because I think people is was th people were thinking that the vertical position of the pedestal and the bunny was the initial state and that this is the the, the final stage that I am I am asking here like to get from this stage to this stage but it was the opposite and yeah maybe it was my fault the way I was explaining this the initial state of of, of, of this system is the the falling stage, right? So the bunny falling and the pedestal falling is kind of the initial state. And I, I want to get from this stage to the vertical one. And also something that is important is that the bunny, I drew the bunny here, right? But the the actual coordinate system of the bunny is, is here on the tail, right? So this is a zero, zero, zero from the bunny. It means that in reality, right? In, yeah, like in, in the real thing that is happening here is that this OBJ, right? The zero, zero, zero of this OBJ is here. It means that in its initial state, the bunny should be here. So she, here should be the bunny. The thing is, I, when I was drawing the image, I was uh, thinking, how, how can I, ex I explain this? And if I, if I was putting the, the bunny here, I think it was harder to see the rotation, right? To understand why the rotation is only 60 degrees and not 90. So I, I decided to put the bunny here to represent the rotation, right? But the bunny originally is here, right? So we need to rotate the bunny 60 degrees, but also take the bunny from its from 0, 0, 0, right? To the new position, right? With respect to its parent. But yeah, again, if it, if it's if this is still confusing, I will I will I will probably uh, modify this um, this slice probably. And, and again, if I need to create a new video, an extra video, whatever, I can do it, right? Oh, so David is asking, so we are missing a translation 000? No, it's, it's not that, that we are missing a translation here in the math. Is that, is that yeah, my, my drawing, the way I drew the, the bunny is incorrect. So maybe... I mean, maybe it will be better if I if if the bunny originally if the bunny is 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 if I take the bunny and I render the bunny here, right? So you can understand that oh, I need to yeah rotate the bunny sixty degrees with respect to the to the pedestal, but also move the bunny here, right? But I, but again, it, it was because I wanted to I I decided to put it here to represent the rotation. But yeah, I, I will definitely 
modify these slides and I will up up update these slides. Um, okay, so how do you know where the origin? So that you have to go. Okay, are you? I'm 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 checking your your question here. I assume that you have. A... Yes, I, your assumption was correct. Your assum assumption was correct, and actually, I'm. I mean, just I I, I haven't seen your your result. Obviously, I'm not seeing your result on the on theory two, but just by by seeing what you are describing, I'm pretty sure you probably have the the right result. And again, if you go and download the zip file that I gave you and you check you check the example solutions you will see I think in particular from all the examples that I gave you the one from 2015 I think is it has the, the best explanations uh, in general and and the one from that one the one from 2015 also has uh, an, an example with a house and I'm pretty sure you will see that yeah that you are probably uh, correct right um, yeah so again the thing is where where is the origin of, 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 of things, right? So the origin is where, where where the coordinate system is, right? So you need to imagine that, imagine that this is a, an OBJ file that you're reading in your system and the pedestal is also an OBJ file, right? And you can have many, many, many objects, right? In your scene. Imagine that you have your scene in Maya, Trees, 2 Max or Blender or whatever, and you're just loading all your OBJs, right? In once. What will happen is that Every every object that you basically load, every object will be exactly on the same zero zero zero, right? So the origin of your three D scene, right? The origin of your world coordinates will be just start to you, you will start to have like all the objects on of your scene will be like to be like overlap. Everything will be overlapped in zero 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 because you haven't moved, you haven't you haven't defined a transformation from those objects into the world coordinates, right? And because each object has its own zero zero zero, at the moment of like reading everything, all zero zero zeros are basically the same. So everything will be just put it exactly on the center. So that is why the bunny will be originally on on the on the same center that uh, the pedestal. Yeah. Okay. So this hierarchy it's uh, super interesting and, and very useful because uh, if you are for example, moving a robot like this one, right? And you are defining the, the transformation matrix for for one of the fingers. Instead of compute to, to have to compute a super complicated transformation matrix for that finger, because that finger is just moving and rotating in a very, very complicated uh, um, uh, trajectory, for example, with respect to the to the to the world, right? You just you say, okay, I don't I don't care. I just care about my transformation, my local transformation with respect to my parent, right? So this finger says, okay, I am only rotating 20 degrees clockwise with respect to the hand. And that's it. I don't care. I just take my local transformation and I pre-multiplied the matrix from my parent times my local transformation and I'm perfectly fine. The final world coordinates for this uh, finger will be perfectly fine. It will be attached to the hand and it will be everything fine. And the same for the hand, right? The hand doesn't need to care about the its final transformation matrix with respect to the world. It just creates a local transformation matrix with respect to its to its parent, right? So this 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 thing of getting uh, getting uh, a a change of matrices that are basically link each other or they they represent uh, like like a chain of objects, right? It's super powerful in terms of animations and other stuff because you just multiply by by the parent and you don't need to to create super super complicated matrices, right? And this is how um, forward kinematics uh, works, right? So we said that uh, again, if you have a system like this, for example, and this this link is the parent of this one, you can construct the transformation matrix of this guy again locally with respect to this guy here right and if you assign a for example a certain rotation to the parent and a certain rotation to the child you will always end up with a specific position from your entire kinematic chain right so if you apply some transformation and you get an end effector position as output that is forward kinematics and inverse kinematics is the opposite is 
telling the computer, no, 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 no. I want you to touch this point and I need you to compute the exact transformation for every single link on the, on the chain. That is called inverse kinematic, right? That is the opposite. And we said that the one of the, um, I will not say that is this, the actual simplest. I think it's the simplest, but I'm not sure. Maybe there is a simplest way. But I think one of the simplest way to compute the inverse kinematic uh, problem, at least for a kinematic chain with only two links, is seeing the problem as a circle-circle intersection, because in that case, you only have two possible options. There is no optimization or anything like that, right? So you just compute the intersections. So you, you, you will typically need one of those, and that is uh, one way to do it. And again, um, I created already a video for the inverse kinematic solution, and I might ask something uh, related to that on the midterm, right? Um, okay, and Toruk has a question. In that question, there was just one coordinate frame Okay, give me a second. So you mean this one here? Uh, one coordinate frame which was based on the origin and filter. Yes, yes, Doruk, yeah, it's correct. I mean, I'm not, this this object right here has also its own coordinate frame. I'm not render, uh, yes, I, I didn't draw, the, draw it, but but yeah, this object has also its own coordinate frame, right? It's not, it's just not there, but yeah, it does. So if it's a if it's a kinematic chain and you're using uh, a hierarchy of transformations, you need to imagine that this this guy also has its own coordinate frame, and it it has it will have a, its local uh, transformation matrix that is then multiplied by the by the by the one from its parent, right? Good. Oh, so what I first oh so which question are you referring from theory two? the the one from the from the house because we were talking about the house also yeah i think it was from the house uh okay so let me th let me remember <laughs> how was that question so in that question there was just one coordinate frame which was based on the origin and the factor position well okay yes but your your question says there was one coordinate frame which was based at the origin and the vector position is just the final position resulted by the movement. But and the vector is a term that we use in kinematics, in inverse kinematics. So that question that we were discussing, it was this question that you have like a house and the house is rotated and whatever. There is no end the vector there, right? I mean, the, the term and the vector, uh, it, it's uh, related exclusively to the final position of a kinematic chain. Right. Okay. So again, we talk about yeah the inverse kinematics, and the final yeah the final uh, steps uh, on our on our lectures was uh, to define the camera transformation. Right. Uh, so again, this is because what we want eventually is to take all this geometry that is already on world coordinates, and we we need to basically uh, translate this world coordinates into camera coordinates, and we said that. We do that not by not by uh, uh, transforming the camera, but transforming the world. Remember, we are basically transforming the world because now the zero 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 and the canonical world, the, the canonical coordinates will be the ones from the camera. So the first step is that we need to compute first a camera transformation, and we these are the all the formulas that we use for for computing this, right? So the w vector usually. It's uh, if you are using Open OpenGL, right? It's uh, it, it needs to point uh, like backwards, right? So it's not pointing on the direction of the target position, but pointing backwards. So this is your formula. Then you need to to get also an up vector from the user, and basically by taking different cross products, you get into this coordinate system. And remember, this coordinate system needs to be they need to be orthogonal, and they need to. That's why we are using cor uh, cross products and also they need to be uh, normalized right they need to be unitary so basically would you create a coordinate system a coordinate frame that represents a camera and that is used uh, usually called view coordinate system 
or the, the well, what we are computing right here is camera transformation, right? And we said that if we want to use that camera transformation to make this translation between world and camera, um, we need the inverse of this matrix, right? So this is the camera matrix and the inverse of that is usually called the view matrix, right? So you can you can write it as M cam um, uh, inverse, right? Or you can also write it as M view, right? The view is usually everybody knows in computer graphics that if you're talking about the view view uh, trans view matrix, sorry, you're referring to the inverse of the camera transformation matrix, right? And um, yes, and the very last thing that we were discussing is basically the orthographic projection that we said that is basically to construct a matrix that will take a view volume that is defined by different planes near far right left top and bottom that is basically like yeah like a like a box right with a certain size and basically it's just to scale translate and reflect that's the coordinates of that box into a tiny box i mean it, it doesn't need to be tiny right i mean maybe your original view volume is actually smaller than the than the normalized device coordinate but let's imagine for now that the the the, the one we are trans transformation that we are doing the, the transformation is, is just a tiny tiny box so it's basically a tiny uh, unitary box that will have uh, values ranging from minus one to to one right and that's it i i, I want to end here because um I, I I will not even ask about the perspective projection or even that matrix because that is the very last things that we discussed and we we still have a lot of this a lot to discuss about those topics so I will not include those things on the midterm again because asking you about things that I know that are still very very confusing and that we haven't finished to discuss that will be horrible and basically useless right so Yes, so we end we end up the 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 review here, and my timing was perfect because I said one hour and forty minutes, and it's exactly one hour and forty minutes right now. <laughs> so yeah, wow, it was good. I need water. Okay, good. So again, I will record. Well, I'm recording this. I will I will uh, upload the recorder, the recording into Canvas and YouTube and everything. Please go and check the example the examples uh, for theory two, it will be very useful if you still haven't uh, finished the uh, the theory two. And if you already finished, just go check it out. Maybe you you, you can check that maybe you are make, making a, um, some mistakes, right? And um, is orthographic projection stuff covered in the midterm? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think I will. If I ask something regarding projection like orthographic projection, it will be like a very conceptual question, right? Like the thing that I just described, right? Like, oh, yes, is orthographic projection. The goal of, of the orthographic projection is basically to rotate, sorry, is uh, scale, translate, and reflect the view volume into the uh, canonical view volume, something like that. Right, and maybe it, it can be like uh, true or false or something like that. But yeah, uh, again, those were the very very last topics, and I will at at at, at this point right right now we haven't get in, uh, deep into that topic, and um, yeah, just conceptually speaking. Okay, so you're asking what is the yes? So basically, the camera transformation, right? So if we don't count projections camera transformation is the most recent so from camera transformation to the back everything can 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 be in the midterm um, everything that have that, that that we have discussed on on the lectures we I mean I, I also obviously suggested several uh, readings right so we have suggesting readings on on the web page and and I also ask for for the readings uh, for the projection in particular but I will not uh, um, I will not add anything that is on on textbooks in particular. So, exclusively things that are on the lectures that we have discussed on the lectures. Only that, okay? And yes, unless if the, again, if there is something that I am pretty sure that 
nobody is still understanding completely, I will probably avoid those those, those type of questions for now, right? Okay. If current friends are present already. Okay, I'm reading a question. So if coordinate, if, if coordinate if a frame, okay, is based on origin, would scaling an object a and scaling a same object b in another position cause output objects of the same proportion? Okay, I think what you are probably asking is what happens if I have let me see if I understand. Uh, I understand your question. And yes, David, I, I, I am seeing that you have a. You raise your hand. So give me just a second. Um, so, I think what you're asking, Doro, tell me if I am if I am wrong. Uh, you're asking, what if I have two objects, right? Let's say that I have two bunnies. One is already on the origin, and one is not on the origin. It's in, just in a different position, right? And I applying I apply the same scale to both objects. So what will happen is, after applying the same scale, is the 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 size of both. Let's say let's say that we are, that you apply a two times the scale, right? So you you increase the the, the size in two times. So basically, the final size of both um, um, of both uh, bunnies, right, will be the same. So both will have the same bigger size. However, the one that it was not on the origin, it will move, right? Because scale is a linear transformation that keeps the origin fixed. So basically what you're, what you're doing, you need to imagine that when you're scaling something, what you're doing is you're taking the position of, the, the position of every vertex on, on that object, and those positions, right, basically they represent a vector. And those vectors, they begin on the 0, 0, 0. So imagine that it's like having just a bunch of thousands of vectors that are coming from zero, 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 and they're going into the position of your objects, right? So when you are applying the scaling, you are, as you are scaling those vectors. So basically, are, by scaling those vectors, you're not just getting the object bigger, but just moving the object kind of in the direction of its vectors, right? So yeah, the result, it will be that the the object that it was not on the origin right it will not only scale but also translate that is why the order operation is important and if you in this case you, you want to only scale you will need to get the the bunny that is that is not in the origin get the bunny to the origin then scale and then get that get the bunny back to to its original position i'm not sure if if that was your question that is the way i just in, uh, understand it okay so i will unmute uh david so David, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, hi. hi. Um, can you go back to the slide where like the bunny falls from the the thing and uh, you have to we have to convert it back? Yes. Yes. Because yes. the confusing slide. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, I know it's confusing, but I, I yes. Uh, so for here, um, uh, okay. First question: Can we? So in B, we have A times some transformation, mm -hmm. right? Can we just sub to substitute um? what a has in there oh you mean instead of saying air yeah. rotate 30 degrees yes of yeah. course yeah or whatever a does yeah. or, okay yeah, yeah. that's possible yeah. right that, that is perfect okay right. so my second question um so the okay so for a b the first um transfer uh, the transformation is the rotation yes. right rotation 60 yeah. degree that's um the origin of that is the bunny like with this uh on the feet yes. of the bunny right but then we do a translation. Uh, the, is and that the origin of that is uh, A's origin, right? Yes, exactly. That is why I, I was. And then we do another rotation of thirty, which backs to the origin of the bunny, which is kind of confusing. Oh, why see, is the origin changing all the time? Okay. Okay. Good question. Okay. So the thing is, first, do you understand why we we actually do need this translation? Because again, I... I drew the bunny here like falling, but in reality, right? Because this bunny has its coordinate frames here. This is its zero, yeah. zero, zero. So at so if if this is the initial state, at the very, very initial state, this bunny should be here, right? Because it's zero, zero, zero should be basically the same position of A and the same position of the zero, zero, zero of the world, right? So basically, imagine the uh... the bunny here, 
right? So we first rotate okay. the bunny 60 degrees. So now the bunny will be rotated. Okay. Yeah, the, the 60 degrees. Yeah. Then yeah. we get the bunny to rotate, sorry, to translate in the coordinate frame of its parent only this, uh, yeah, this amount, like 0 0.45 and 4.2, right? So we will get in this position. And the thing is, this 30 degrees rotation yeah, it, it, I know it's it sounds um, weird, but it's just similar to what just described. So imagine that at that point, after rotating the, the bunny 60 degrees and after moving the bunny with respect to its parent, yeah. this amount, oh. it means that now the bunny is, is, it will be here, right? Imagine that it's rotated, but it will be here, okay. right? So because yeah. it is here, by applying a rotation of 30 degrees, and remember, rotation is a linear operation, so because it is a linear operation, it remains the origin fixed. So you're okay. basically taking the entire bunny and it's rotated 30 degrees, but in this okay. direction, right? Because now I because see. now the origin of this rotation is A. Uh -huh. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, but uh, okay, that backs I th to I think, the question. Yes, I think I, I think I will I, I, again I, I think I will modify these slides and I will probably make <laughs> Uh, yes. A quick, uh, I think I also like uh, created like a quick animation, and actually let me let me show you something. I have. Uh, but but I want to ask is if the bunny is at this picture where where it is in the picture, we have to translate it to the origin, then do the rotation sixty and uh, everything else, right? Uh, oh yeah yes yes exactly yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah good, it, good. that yeah. is a very good question of course. Yes, if okay. these were, if this was, if, if this were the the actual initial initial state of the bunny, and again, yeah, my, my, my uh -huh. drawing, uh, it was confusing. Uh, yes, we you should first get the bunny to the origin, apply the rotation, and then they're gonna the, get the bunny back. Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah yes. that's uh, So so the bunny doesn't have its own like uh, origin yes. stuff. Uh, okay. Let me show you this. This is another uh, another uh, example. I mean, it's, 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 I don't know if it, this is confusing, but yeah, it's kind of like a robot. But for example, let's let's see. So the M M1 is basically the matrix of this, of the torso of this uh, character, right? And um, so it has basically the translation X and Y, right? Some, this X and Y translation, right? And it has some rotation with theta one, right? So it has rotation, theta one, this is basically this rotation. So th this is basically the transformation of this object M1. This is, this is, this slide is not mine, but I, I don't know if this, this can help. Uh, okay, and then we have the second object, which is this one, right? So if we see the initial state of these objects, I don't know, I don't know if it's clear, right? But you can see the object here, right? So the second object here is here. So as you can see, with respect to its parent, which is the torso, the coordinates of this of this position is basically one, two point five, and five point five. You agree? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But again, the way we usually draw this type of things in a, in a in a lecture like this, right? We usually draw them in their final position. But this position is the original zero zero of this of this uh, of this shape, right? So again, be, it's, it's supposed to be like down, down. It, yeah, I mean, if we are, if we want, if we wish to to be like super precise in in the in the in the in the drawing, okay. this this object right here should be drawn in this position, right? Yes. yes. But again, imagine this drawing with with all the all the objects basically overlap here. It will be also very very confusing, right? So we usually draw them in their <laughs> intended position not in their original position right so the its intended yes. position is basically these uh -huh. coordinates right and with re, it's this coordinates yeah. it all this guy needs to basically rotate theta 2 it means that the matrix from this second object is rotating theta 2 and translating that that amount and then multiply by its parent so it's basically the same example as as as, as the bunny right you you could say why only why i need translations if it's already there and why I don't need it, it, right? It seems that no, no, no. But, but, but if it's if the object is already there, I should first get the object to the origin, then apply the transform yes. uh, the rotation, and then get get it back, right? But the thing is, yeah, it yeah. will be super. It will also there. be super confusing 
if we draw everything exactly on its own origin, right? So yeah, it's just a, the way we usually, it's usually explained. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, it could be confusing, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah, it's coming not to show that like it starts at yes. the origin. I, I, and, and again, I, th I think this is exactly the type of things that with with the fixed images is super difficult to understand. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, but luckily I I know how to do uh, 3D animation, so I will do an animation explaining this. Okay. 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 Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, yeah, so I think we can finish, right? Nobody else is asking, as uh, raising hands. So thank you so much. I will. Oh, will all questions be multiple choice in the midterm? Good question, Daruk. Uh, a lot of questions are multiple choice. We have some questions that are uh, open, that are like essay that I I am asking you to describe something, and, and I ask you to actually write uh, text, and. Um, Yes, and, and, and there are also some questions in which we ask you to compute something and just literally. So it's not all, it's not only multiple questions. It's not all only uh, multiple choice. Yeah, but most of them are actually multiple choice. Um, thank you, uh, Raunak. Okay, good, perfect. So again, I will I will give you more details uh, soon about the midterm. I will uh, I will tell you uh, I will send this like a mock up midterm. And remember, uh, if you have time to connect synchronously, please tell me. Okay, please send me send me an email. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Work. Bye.